All right, volumes seem pretty simple up front, but there's actually a lot to it. So the first way you can tell a container that it needs to worry about a volume is in the Docker file. And let's go check some of those out. So I'm just gonna do what I do a lot, and I'm gonna search for my SQL. So this is how I learned so much about Docker files and how to use them correctly, is the official repositories have really sound defaults and best practices built into them. So I'm gonna go over here to my SQL one. I'm just gonna click on the latest Docker file here. And I bet you because it's a database, it's probably got a volume command in it. Yep, there we go. So this is the default location of the MySQL databases. And this image is programmed in a way to tell Docker that when we start a new container from it, to actually create a new volume location and assign it to this directory in the container, which means any files that we put in there in the container will outlive the container until we manually delete the volume. And that's something we should point out here is that volumes need manual deletion. You can't clean them up just by removing a container. They're an extra step. And that's just for insurance, really, because the whole point of a volume command is to say that this data is particularly important, at least much more important than the container itself. So if we do a Docker pull on MySQL, and then I do a Docker image inspect on MySQL, we don't get to see the Docker file because the Docker file isn't actually part of the image metadata, which you'll notice in this config area that it specified that volume there. So I can always tell that the config that came from the Docker file when it was built assigned a volume to that path. So let's run a container from it. So Docker container run dash D dash dash name my SQL. And if you remember from earlier, uh, the MySQL one's a little special. It now requires an environment variable before it'll work. So it's MySQL underscore allow underscore empty underscore password. Okay. We should see our MySQL running. And if we do a Docker container inspect MySQL, we should see the same thing where it tells us in the config that there's a volume here. We can also see it up here under mounts. And what this is, is this is actually the running container getting its own unique location on the host to store that data. And then it's in the background mapped or mounted to that location in the container so that the location in the container actually just thinks it's writing to slash var slash lib slash MySQL. But in this case, we can see that the data is actually living in that location on the host. So let's do a Docker volume LS, and we can see we have now one volume. And now we notice that it's got that unique ID that we'll never know what the heck that goes to, right? So let's do an inspect on that. Now you don't have to type the whole thing out. You can just type the first couple of characters and hit tab to complete it, but you'll get that similar information about the volume itself. Now, if you're actually doing this on a Linux machine, you could navigate to that location on your hard drive and see the data. There'll actually be some databases there. But if you're on a Mac or Windows, remember that Docker for Windows and Docker for Mac are actually doing a little bit in the background that's hidden from us where it's actually creating a Linux VM. And so this data is technically inside that Linux VM. So you're not gonna be able to go to that path on your Windows or Mac machine and see the data. It's actually inside that VM. But we'll see in a little bit with mounted volumes how we can get around that limitation as well. So by looking at this, you notice that it's not very user friendly in terms of telling us what's in it or what this volume is assigned to. We can see from the container's perspective what volume it's using, but we can't see from the volume perspective what it's connected to, right? And if I were just to hit the up arrow and um, let's see, create a MySQL 2, so that's now created another MySQL server running in the background. And if I do another Docker volume LS, you'll see two of them. You start to see the problem, right? There's no real easy way here to tell one from the other. And if we just to prove a point, do a Docker container stop MySQL and a Docker container stop MySQL 2 and we do a Docker container LS, we'll not see any containers running. If we do an LS-A, we get to see them all. 
and notice that they're stopped. And then we do a Docker volume ls, you know, so we still have the two volumes. Now, if I do a Docker container rm MySQL and then MySQL2, because I can actually do both of those in one command, it will remove both my containers. And if I now do a Docker volume ls, my volumes are still there. My data is still safe. So we've solved one problem. The databases outlive the executable. So how do we make this a little more user friendly? Well, that's where named volumes come in and the ability for us to specify things on the Docker run command. So if I hit the up arrow a couple of times till I get to the Docker container run, it doesn't really matter which one you're gonna run again. In this case, we're going to actually throw in a dash V command. And a dash V allows us to specify either a new volume that we wanna create for this container that's about to run, or it allows us two other options. One of them here is to create a named volume. So if I just did dash V and then the var lib mysql, that would do the same thing as what our volume command in the Docker file did. So we don't really need to do that here. But what we can do is I can put a name in front of it with a colon. That's known as a named volume. And when I do that and then do a Docker volume ls, you'll see that my new container is using a new volume and it's using a friendly name. So if we do a Docker volume inspect on that MySQL, you'll see that this is easier to use here. And if I deleted my container again, and we have to put in a dash F because it's still running, and then I run another one, and this time I'll give it a different name, and then we do another Docker volume LS, you'll see that it looks like we haven't created a new volume. It's still using the same volume. So let's do a Docker container inspect on the MySQL 3. And then what we'll see up here is yes, this is what was configured, but what are we running? This is our mounts up here. So we'll see here that not only is the name friendlier, but it actually changed the source location to be a little friendlier as well. So for me, a little tip here is that when I am running for days or weeks at a time, a particular database in a particular container that I need to keep using over and over, and I don't want a blank database server, I'll end up creating my containers this way and naming them for the project so that I know what that volume's for and that it needs to stick around. Now, one last thing here. Why would you want to do Docker volume create? So if we can create them from a Docker container run command at runtime, and we can create them by specifying them in the Docker file, there's only a few cases where you'd wanna create it ahead of time. And you can actually figure that out pretty quickly by using the help command, because here is the only way that we can actually specify a different driver. Remember that plugin stuff I'm gonna talk about later? And then any driver options that we wanna use the dash O on, and then if we wanna put labels on it, which we'll also talk about later in the production section. So sometimes in special cases, you do need to create the Docker volume ahead of time, but usually for your local development purposes, just specifying in a Docker file or at the run command is fine. 